Hi, thank you so much, Craig. Thank you so much, everyone, uh, for making the time uh, to be here today and to talk about um, responsible design and production of consumer packaged goods, which is a theme I, um, we've been working a lot recently at SAP. Um, I wanted to um, first talk about, you know, setting the scene a little bit. Um, we know that um, only 9% of the world is actually circular, and this means that 91% of everything we produce goes to waste, most likely landfill or uh, ocean. So the forecast is that plastic alone uh, is expected to triple by 2040. So waste manage management infrastructures need to be in place in order to account for this, uh, for, for the waste. And uh, the problem we are facing is that although the problem is very well understood, we're really going to a point in which technology is necessary to uh, put together action plans uh, that match with, uh, with the commitments that uh, many companies around the world have, have made for uh, 2030. So the focus now is really on how companies can embrace change. And, uh, and, and so there are certain components um, in this, for the solution of this problem. One is, uh, of course, uh, reducing the waste and increasing usability of materials. But the other side of the coin is really to improve the state of local infrastructure. And one without the other um, does really um, produce the results that we are we are looking for. So how to achieve zero waste? Um, driven by disruptive factors such as the voluntary agreements or regulatory compliance, responsible design and production of, of goods is the answer that businesses are, are adopting to eliminate waste across the supply chain. So the vision is that companies are able to provide a global view of waste materials across the various product life cycles. So that includes design phase, production phase, the sales channels, and, and also the end of life of those, um, of, of those products. So the technical solution will need to include the most relevant EPRs. So the EPRs are the extended producer, producer responsibility, um, which are basically legal frameworks um, that are being developed around the world for uh, reporting issues. So um, what this means is that, um, and, and this map gives a little bit, puts into perspective where we are at the moment, these EPR schemes were created to place responsibility for the environmental impact um, on the producer, and, uh, and that ensures that the producers are responsible for all the disposal options at the end of life of the materials. At the European Union um, level, all member states already have implemented EPR schemes, but not all of them have implemented a tax system to ensure compliance of those EPR schemes. And so without taxation, one can say that it's a, it's a recommendation without, uh, um, uh, without uh, you know, any, any mechanism to force businesses to act. Although what's, uh, what's happening is that um, it's very clear the, direc the direction that it's happening. So in, in April 1st uh, next year, all the businesses that operate in the UK will need to, um, uh, to report on their, uh, on their packaging. Otherwise, they face uh, taxes. So there's a taxing mechanism or, um, that will be in place from 1st of April 2022. Um, and businesses that do not comply with that reporting will need to pay uh, fines for for, for that non-compliance. So um, there are other countries in Europe that, that already have tax systems in place. One uh, would be Spain, other would be um, Italy, but the direction is really clear. And, and the direction is there will be taxation coming for, for non-compliance, which is new. Um, historically speaking, businesses did not really have to be sustainable. So the assumption of endless resources and, um, and externalization of environmental costs has given rise to a linear approach of use and dispose of waste across the value chain. Um, so the consumer packaged goods, what's happening is that they are now starting to use data as a new basis for scale across the value chain. And the objective is to operate in a more circular economy space. But what are the use cases that will really enable businesses to execute the changes that their leaders have already committed to? 
Or in other words, how can businesses avoid greenwashing and actually change the way that they operate in the value chain um, and report on, on those changes? So I think it's always important to look at, uh, at the flow of where the investments are going. So at ECP, we believe that the answer is really in the startup ecosystem. And we are investing in products and solutions that natively integrate with many of these game changers. So it is important to note that since 2012, around 1,300 startups raised capital from uh, impact investing funds. So since 2018, we are talking about more than 70 billion pounds were raised for impact businesses. And for a fund to qualify to, to be considered a, an impact fund, it needs to, to have certain criteria. So that includes, of course, investing for financial results. So um, um, all of the funds all, always have a component of uh, bringing profit to the investors. But there are other elements that that come into impact funding. So that will be um, the, the the intention of create a positive impact in the environment or or, or in social metrics as well. Um, so the, the the other point that these funds need to to comply with is they need to measure ESG criteria. So that would include, for example, um, being part of the UN Sustainability Development Goals. Um, and, and last, um, for a fund to be considered impact funding, it needs to be um, uh, it needs to be self-identified as such. So um, the solutions exist and they are receiving finance uh, and being adopted by many businesses. But uh, scale for wider adoption is still far from the environmental goals that we need uh, collectively to achieve by 2030. So some of these startups in the plastic sector alone already have an impressive footprint, but maybe you've never heard of some of these names. And so I took some examples from our network and uh, you can learn more about them by, by looking into circle.com or, or contacting us at ACP to, to look at some of the, of the startups that we are working with. So Reprieve um, recovers plastic bottles and industrial plastic waste and melts down and used to produce a range of fibers um, for different uses. So these fibers are customizable and can be adapted for a range of uses from sportswear to car accessories and etc. And so far they have recycled more than 20 billion plastic bottles that otherwise would be in the environment. Uh, now more than 100 brands are using Reprieve's materials and that includes the cosmetics multinational Natura, for example. Um, another one, Scrapo. So Scrapo is an online marketplace which aims to make the trade in recyclable materials more accessible and efficient, avoiding the need for lengthy negotiations. Um, with much uh, plastic waste ending in landfill, this, this is like an eBay for recycled plastic that can help um, um, to bridge the gap between scrap buyers and sellers. Through its website and mobile apps, Scrapple provides what it calls the world's largest plastic recycling mar marketplace with more than 40,000 businesses registered on the website. Real-time negotiation tools are made available and so this avoids email and then phone contact, making the process really, really efficient. Another example, Paboco. So in the US alone, uh, more than 60 million plastic bottles are thrown away every day. And to reduce such a use of plastic, Paboco has developed an alternative to plastic, a recyclable paper bottle. And um, the aim is um, to produce for all of the big uh, CPG brands worldwide um, uh, this, using this material for the bottles. And so far, they've been working with Coca-Cola, with Carlsberg and with Absolute. Vesta Smart, um, probably one of the startups in the ecosystem that uh, with more um, with more PR and then with more um, uh, probably you've heard of them. They 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 make a very smart use of IoT technology to reduce single use plastic, 
um, this technology provides the consumer with a smart packaging container that connects to an intelligent platform via an app. So the app monitors, is able to monitor how the customer is uh, using the household item and manages the supply echo refill. Uh, so uh, the packs are then delivered automatically, allowing the user to top up their connected smart container. Not only does this reduce single waste plastic, but the smart container provides the brand with data, uh, customer data around how the customer is using and um, a, a particular product, which is really important data, of course. So the smart packs can track many customer centric metrics, including who buys the product, how they use it and how it's uh, much is needed. Uh, there are, of course, certain regulations in place, like in Europe, GDPR compliance, of course, which will need to be accounted for with, the, with this use case as well. Um, Another example I would like to talk about, of course, is in retail. And in retail, Lush is a great example of a multinational brand operating zero waste uh, packaging free shop. So Lush has opened completely plastic free naked shops in Milan, Manchester, Berlin and Hong Kong. Lush uses ethically sourced regenerative reusable containers made of cork mainly, as well as uh, not wraps to carry home products. To allow customers to check ingredients, Lush also created an AI product recognition tool, which recognizes the item and brings up a list of information um, on the smartphone. And that's what I had for you today. And I would like to take some questions from the audience. Maria, thank you so much. Great presentation. Um, so first question, like many retailers, as you mentioned, they claim to be uh, pursuing sort of sustainable policies. They like to talk a lot about their ESG uh, policies, but we've seen many recent examples of greenwashing. How do we keep retailers, how do we keep brands honest? Um, and that's a great question and then and, and such a difficult one because it's not as simple for marketeers to, um, to be able to explain the complexity of what's actually happening in terms of value chain transformation and bring that into a message that people can easily consume. Um, traditionally, uh, in, a, in, a, in a more linear model, um, the, you know, the storytelling of a brand uh, was, was much easier. I think you know, companies avoid greenwashing by really making a marketing exercise of really going deeper than usual, because this is a complex story. You, you, you know, in, in a few minutes here, I was able to talk about uh, a few examples of companies that, uh, you know, startups that are trying to, to change the game in the industry. But I mean, look at, to make this story so simple, I had to understand the complexity of what they are doing. Otherwise, I would just be talking about things in the surface and that would that that is not what, what marketing can continue doing at all. We really need to go deeper to then simplify the message and being able to talk with wider audiences uh, without using only the negative um, uh, part of the narrative. We all know that the planet <laughs> has been, um, uh, you know, increasingly um, getting, you know, pollution. We know all, all of us know that. So what is the solution towards that and how do we get people involved? And I'm curious to get your thoughts on what new economic models do you see developing as we shift towards this circular economy? Uh, there are many business models um, like, uh, you know, the, the, the ones I see more often and I, I see already being implemented um, are related with uh, reutilization of, uh, of materials, so second hand is, is one, uh, one area, or simply reassembling the product in a completely different shape and resell it uh, as a new product. So fashion has been doing some of these, uh, of these use cases. Um, the utilization of, of blockchain is, is getting wider adoption as well. Um, I mean, particularly when it comes to authenticity of products. And again, fashion has been one of the industries, um, um, you know, really investing heavily on, on, on some of these proof of concepts. Uh, the food industry is quite new at the moment with, with some of this, but it's super important that all of the food um, brands out there and, and uh, grocery retailers uh, start to adopting more circular models as well. And, um, and so track and trace of materials is, is a very important one. First of all, Craig, this is simple. We need to have visibility of data. With visibility of data, the decision-making is possible. Yeah, yeah. 
Okay, very quick final question. Just supposing you, you, know, you, you weren't at SAP, but you were in fact an entrepreneur. Um, where do you think you would be looking in terms of an opportunity for a new kind of business within the circular economy? Well, um, at the moment, I'm really, really interested in uh, augmented reality use cases. <laughs> um, I think, uh, I think in, in some industries, the ability to see the product before it's actually produced um, may reduce some of the waste that, that we are creating. And, um, and I'm interested in, in, um, in utilization of blockchain. Um, I, I think we're still quite in a in a very uh, early stage of utilization of uh, of blockchain for uh, for software applications. Uh, there are of course good examples, but we need to see wider adoption. It doesn't just count to see good ideas. We need to see those good ideas being scaled. Great, that's a great way to finish. I think Maria, thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you so much for joining us here at Wired Retail. Thank you.